So I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, second half of, of this year's Shallow Town Symposium. Uh, I bothered to read the program. This is actually the fifth shall annual Shallow Town Symposium. Uh, the symposium is uh, named in honor of two of the laser pioneers, uh, Art Shallow, who was Canadian, and the person who happened to be his brother-in-law, uh, Charles Towns. Uh, who happened to be my thesis supervisor. So, so in fact, uh, Professor Towns showed up for the very first uh, Shallow Town Symposium, and I like to think that I tricked him into doing so. If I tell this story every year, my apologies. I told him we were going to have a yearly symposium in honor of our Shallow, and would he please come and be the speaker at it. Now, I knew that Professor Towns was uh, uh, sufficiently humble that he might not really have been happy uh, to uh, e even speak at a symposium series named after him. So it was not until he arrived in Ottawa that I told him, well, it's actually the Shallow Town Symposium. <laughs> this is just a, a little issue of detail that perhaps did not come through uh, in, in my uh, uh, original invitation. So we have, we're, we're really honored to have uh, two additional superb uh, speakers for the afternoon session. And let me first uh, in introduce uh, Alexander Gaeta. Of relevance to many of you, he was born in Canada. Isn't that nice? <laughs> uh, he, he then moved to, to Buffalo, New York, uh, which, well, some of us think is good. <laughs> I was also brought up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, so so uh, Alex was brought up in the same hometown as me. Uh, he then uh, did his undergraduate, master's degree, PhD degree, and postdoctoral work at the University of Rochester. Uh, at the time when I was there, I, I, was, I had the honor of being Alex's uh, PhD uh, thesis supervisor. Uh, after leaving Rochester, he took a faculty position at Cornell University, stayed there 15 or more? 20, 23. We're getting older, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Over 20 years, and just recently uh, moved to uh, Cornell University. Columbia. Columbia University, <laughs> where, where he is the David M. Rickey Professor of Applied Physics. Uh, Alex is very well known for a large number of contributions to uh, optical science and photonics, uh, including uh, nanophotonics, uh, quantum optics, and especially self-action effects uh, cell focusing effects, uh, filamentation in nonlinear optics. So I present Alex Gaeta to you. Uh, thanks, Bob. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and particularly uh, uh, in honor of this uh, two great uh, laser physicists, uh, Arthur Charlot and Charles Towns. I actually uh, shared two two things with uh, Charles Towns. I actually only met him once, but uh, of course, as Bob pointed out, he was my grand advisor, uh, since he was Bob's advisor. And we also shared the same birthday. Um, so, uh, um, so it's a pleasure to be here. So what I, I want to talk to you about today is two things that seem completely disparate, which is frequency combs and quantum random number generation. But I want to point out that uh, these are things that now can be reduced to being produced on a chip. And not only that, uh, it turns out in this particular case, they're both using the exact same device. So it, it shows you uh, really what can be done uh, now in a very compact uh, platform. So uh, Bob told me that I should uh, treat this as sort of a more of a colloquium. So I'm going to give the one view graph summary of Bob's book. Uh, which is nonlinear optics. And, and certainly, uh, when people, uh, non experts, non scientists, ask me what do I do, and I say nonlinear optics, it just draws blank stares. Uh, so uh, I always try to summarize it because, you know, trying to talk in terms of you know, where the nonlinear comes from, but I will, I'll just summarize it as this I look at nonlinear optics, and certainly it forms a big part of my talk, as the generation of new frequencies. Okay, so you start off with one frequency and you can actually create another frequency. And so I think that's actually a pretty good summary for the non-experts. And so the origin of where these new frequency comes from, though, can be understood from this kind of toy model, which to this day I still think of and use in my mind when I think about interactions of light with matter. Uh, so we have some electric field here, and, and we model our atom 
as a nucleus, which is pretty heavy, and then an electron, which is uh, attached to this nucleus through a spring. And of course, in real life, there's not really a spring there. In fact, if you go to quantum mechanics, you even wonder where the spring comes from. But the classical model works incredibly well. And so normally, when you think about a spring, you say, well, it has a restoring force, in, which is linearly proportional to its displacement from the nucleus. And if you want to think, if you just integrate this force, you get its potential. And so it's actually sitting in a parabolic potential. But just like real springs, when you pull them apart, what you find is they no longer pull in this linear, with this linear force, but they usually deviate from that. And so you might correct for that by adding, for example, uh, uh, you know, doing a, uh, an expansion that goes maybe quadratic, cubic, and so on. So the real potential might actually look like that. And that actually starts looking a little more like a, a true potential uh, that, that any atom or molecule might have for the electron. Now, if you just take this picture and you do you know, a little bit of math, but you can already see that this forms a dipole moment. If I take 10 to the 21 of these per cubic centimeter, I, form, you know, I have a material there. And so you actually get a macroscopic dipole moment or the polarization of the material. And actually, there's a linear correspondence between this linear restoring force and the fact that the polarization or macroscopic dipole moment is linearly proportional electric field. And all textbooks on electromagnetism stop there. Okay, so they just say that this is the susceptibility, but it's actually truly the linear susceptibility. That is, this macroscopic dipole moment is linearly proportional to the electric field. But this term here actually leads to a term that's actually quadratic in the electric field. This term leads to one that's cubic. And so this is where the term nonlinear optics come from. It's the fact that this macroscopic polarization scales in a nonlinear way with the applied electric field. So it turns out that for most materials, actually, I'll say it the other way around, for just a few classes of crystals, will you find that actually you get a polarization, uh, a second order polarization, which is non-vanishing, okay? So most of what I'm gonna be talking about today, in fact, all I wanna talk about are materials, which could be amorphic materials, glass, gases, so liquids, and in most materials, this is the lowest order nonlinear term, and so it's cubic, and this is the one I'll focus on for this talk. So as I said, uh, light involves a generation of U frequencies, so what I, I show you here is actually a chip. This is actually a chip, and on this chip, it contains a, a bus waveguide that comes in, circles around, and then goes into a spiral, and then leaves and comes out this way. And it turns out that if you couple light in from this side, and this is actually a fiber, which couples in, stops at this point here, and couples onto this chip. And what you find is this pulse, the light that's coming in is actually a femtosecond pulse, but relatively, you know, it's around 800 nanometers. You can barely see it by eye, so it's red, so you see a little bit of the red light. But as it propagates in this waveguide very quickly, what you see is it generates essentially white light coming out. In fact, if you look at the output here, you actually look at its spectrum, it covers a broad uh, the whole visible range, pretty much. And in fact, if you were to look, uh, the light that was actually coupled in here, this is, I'm sorry, I said 800 nanometers, is actually at 1,500 nanometers. So it actually covers everything from basically 700 nanometers all the way out to 1,500 nanometers, it actually covers all the way out to beyond two microns. Okay, so starting with just a relatively narrow light source, I can generate these new frequencies. And this was done on a chip, is not what I'm gonna talk about today. But what I'll be talking about today is, is starting off with an incredibly narrow light source, one that's actually maybe only has a bandwidth of a megahertz, maybe even a few kilohertz, and that it's possible to generate these kind of spectra starting from a single, single frequency source. So in, in my lab, we actually uh, do nonlinear optics, you know, generate new frequencies, if you want to think, over a, a very broad range of, of powers. So we actually have a terawatt laser. We do intense field physics, as, as Bob said, self-focusing filamentation and gases. And that typically occurs, you know, if it's in solids to gases, anywhere from 10 megawatts to a terawatt. Uh, we also do a lot of nonlinear optics and just sort of different kinds of optical fibers. And typically in there, you're working from a watt to maybe 100 kilowatts. Um, we, we also do, uh, cover, uh, we, do, we inject atoms into hollow core photonic band gap fibers. We can actually do nonlinear optics at the 10 picowatt level. It's down to almost a few, a few photon level. And so if you work out 10 picowatts to one terawatts, that's 23 orders of magnitude. The point is, is you know, certainly 
you know, when nonlinear optics was created, it was always thought that you needed intense field, really strong, high-powered lasers. But in fact, you know, the idea that you can use a laser pointer to do nonlinear optics has, has come, is, is long gone. You, you can actually work at even lower powers than that. So for this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is our chip-based nanophotonics. And, you know, typically we operate anywhere from powers where we see strong nonlinear optical effects from sort of the tens of microwatts to a few, maybe 100 milliwatts. And, uh, and, th and that'll be the subject of this talk here. So um, as I, s I mentioned, all this is being done on chip. And actually early on, you know, when I thought about it, this was really the only reason why I thought you'd want to do nonlinear optics, which is particularly if you work with uh, uh, a platform that's silicon based. So this could be, in, in my case, silicon or silicon nitride is that you can integrate electronics and photonics together. And this is happening already. Intel is, ha, actually has products out there. IBM has products. So this is happening. Silicon photonics is going to be you know, part of the daily lives in computers and in data centers and so on. So it's already there. So this turns out to be really important. And you think, well, for nonlinear optics, as we'll see, actually, you know, currently my favorite nonlinear material, and I think there's lots of reasons to argue, what is the best nonlinear optical material currently in the world? Uh, you know, pardon the ITO or, or ASIO, but I'll say silicon nitride, and I think there's good reasons for it. So, you know, silicon nitride, which will form a bulk of my talk, is just a fantastic material. It has a lot of good properties, very low losses. And so for nonlinear optics, it's very good. But don't underestimate that if you ever want to see nonlinear optics actually uh, be part of our daily lives, this is an important aspect that photonics and electronics can be integrated together. So here I'm just showing kind of a sketch. Uh, this is a, a silicon waveguide. Uh, this is a substrate underneath here. It's uh, silicon dioxide. In this particular case, you don't, it's unclad, but normally you would clad it with silicon dioxide. But you know, a typical waveguide might look, this is the end, looks something like this. And so this is just a schematic of what it looks like. So you could have silicon here or silicon nitride. And for most of the devices we work with, it's surrounded by basically glass. Uh, so it's a, you know, silicon dioxide. Now, of course, uh, these two materials, silicon and silicon nitride, work in different wavelength regimes. Silicon has a band edge at 1.1 microns, so a lot of the early work uh, you know, has been done at 1.5 microns. It turns out that there's nonlinear absorption there, free carrier effects. But where we've uh, recently, where we really found silicon to be great is actually as you push more into the mid-infrared. So we're now, as I'll talk about, being able to generate frequencies out in the mid-infrared beyond four microns, and silicon's very good to, to work with out there. Silicon nitride has a band edge around 400 nanometers, and so uh, in that case, it covers really the full visible spectrum, as you saw from the, the previous uh, um, picture. So in terms of nonlinearity, and this is a big win, and early on when, when silicon was viewed as a possible nonlinear optical material, it has a nonlinearity, which is 100 times. That is, that chi-3 that you saw there is 100 times that of glass. So in terms of conventional fibers, that's a big win. Um, silicon nitride is a factor of 10, so these are really large. And a key part here is that the light is confined to a wavelength or, or less, and I mean the wavelength in free space, because, you know, again, silicon has a refractive index of 3.5, so if you think in terms of area, how tightly the light is, it actually goes like n squared. So actually, you can confine the light a factor of 10 times higher in silicon than you could in free space. So that's a big win, too, because intensity is what matters. So, you know, the area is in the denominator. So there's a factor of 10 enhancement. Nonlinearity is a factor of 100 times higher. So there's a factor of 1,000 right there, just for silicon. And usually that is the argument that everyone uses for why we should use a silicon silicon nitride. I think actually the more powerful one is this one here. And this one has, in, in, in my opinion, has been the dominant reason why um, these materials are so effective and nanophotonics is being so successful in its use in nonlinear optics is that this conf confinement that you use here to boost up your intensity also can dramatically change the dispersion. And, um, you know, one thing I keep coming back to in nonlinear optics, actually in optics in general, is intensity is kind of the sexy thing, right? 10 to the 16, 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. But in the end, I think the most important part of optics is phase. 
that's why I keep coming back to, is the control of phase actually turns out for most things, I know Paul would say that for all his high harmonic generation and everything else, that phase is what actually matters more than anything. And so it's this control of dispersion that allows us to control the phase, and that turns out to be the most critical aspect. So this is just an outline. I'll first introduce four-wave mixing um, and talk about this dispersion tailoring and engineering. And then I'll talk about how we use that to generate optical frequency combs. I'll talk a lot, a lot, a little bit about the dynamics. You know, I, <coughs> Bob, when I was a graduate student, he was always pushing us to uh, try to think of what nonlinear optics can be good for. And particularly, he was always saying it's important to do nonlinear optics with laser pointer powers. So we're there yet. And, and I'd, I'd really like to see nonlinear optics become part of the everyday life of, let's say, consumers uh, and go beyond the green laser pointer. And certainly nonlinear optics has yet to be there, but you know, of all the things I've worked on personally, this to me is the closest. And so the generation of these frequency combs I really see in the next decade actually could become part of sort of daily lives. And then I'll talk about photonic computing. This was actually, uh, it doesn't look like it, but was a four-letter word for a long time. Um, uh, but, uh, it, you know, I, I, this was actually one of the reasons I, I got into nonlinear optics and, and became very excited about it as a graduate student. I was very interested in bi optical bistability, which then got poo-pooed for, for two decades. But I think you're beginning to see it coming back, and certainly, uh, you know, this is highlighted in um, Peter, uh, Peter Knight's talk about uh, using quantum computing and, and optics for that. So, uh, but I'm going to be talking about sort of a more classical system from which to do computing, and then I'll, I'll, how one can use that to generate random numbers. So here's uh, the process that, that everything I'm talking about is based on a process of four-wave mixing, and it consists of the following. Just imagine that you have, again, this chi-3 medium, which has a polarization that goes like E cubed. And, and let's say I, I bring in a pump and a signal. They come in together, and what you find is that they actually mix in here. That's the term. It's mixing. And you can actually generate the idler. And how does this occur? Well, if you take E cubed here, I have two fields at two different frequencies, and I multiply, I cube them. You're going to get a lot of terms, but one of the terms you get is one that goes twice the pump frequency, this one here, minus omega the signal frequency. Okay, so that's a new frequency, and if you want to think of, well, what frequency, this new frequency, does that correspond to? Well, if you can think of from this picture here, is that uh, it corresponds to the annihilation of two pump photons, and then the creation of a signal photon, and then this is the new frequency that also gets created, the either photon. So this is actually why this is called four-wave mixing, because you'd say, well, you only have three waves here, why'd you call it four-wave mixing? It's really that at the microscopic level, I'm, I'm still working with four photons at a time. It's just that two of them are from the pump. Okay, so that's the term forward mixing. Turns out it's not so simple. As I said, there's actually two other terms. There's many terms that show up. And another one that shows up, other than this forward mixing term, is a term that, that, that actually involves the idler itself, but it involves the intensity of the pump. And this term actually is what's called cross-phase modulation. It's changing the refractive index of the idler beam as it propagates the material due to the presence of pump. So there's two terms that show up there, okay? And that turns out to be very critical because this is the one. So here this is telling you I ha we have energy conservation, but we, for this to occur efficiently, we also need momentum conservation. And it turns out that this term affects the momentum conservation part. So as I said, we have energy conservation, two pump photons adds up to the signal and idler. The momentum conservation, you'd say, well, it's two, prop it's two, uh, two of the you know, photon momenta plus the signal momenta plus the idler momenta, but it's not so simple because actually the refractive index of these materials is here. So in general, this is not going to add up to zero if this does. Not only that, but there's those cross-phase modulation terms, and, and those are an additional part. And so in general, this is non-trivial to get this to also add up to zero if you want this process to occur efficiently. But it turns out that under the right conditions, this part, which is usually non-zero, zero, if this is negative, you can get it to go with this part, which is usually positive, and you can actually get this to go to zero. And it turns out that this occurs in what's known as the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. And it corresponds to this negative of the second order derivative of the refractive index if that's greater than zero, you're in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. 
And it turns out for most materials, actually, certainly most of the ones that we operate in the visible near IR, it's always normal group velocity dispersion. So this is non-trivial to get to this regime. But here I show you, and this is for the case of silicon nitride, what this dispersion, group velocity dispersion, looks like as a function of wavelength, okay? So the black dotted line is the bulk silicon nitride. This is negative, which corresponds to normal group velocity dispersion. Positive is anomalous. And you can see that the bulk material, pretty much through this whole regime, is fairly large and negative. That is normal. However, as you change the size of the waveguide, change its dimensions, you can actually begin introducing group velocity dispersion. It turns out, the, at least to first order, it usually waveguide, this waveguide dispersion is usually anomalous. And so the end result is, for different sizes of waveguides, you can actually push this curve up and push it up so that you get these broad regimes of anomalous group velocity dispersion. So if I try to do four wave mixing in these regimes here where I bring in a pump anywhere here, I can do it very efficiently. And it can lead, as we'll see, to parametric gain. Okay. So the key part, again, one takeaway from here, if I want to do four wave mixing efficiently, I want to be in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. It's just uh, almost second nature um, in, in everything that, that, that we're trying to do. Um, I do want to say a, a key part here. So, you know, you sometimes hear the term nanophotonics all the time. And you'd say, well, this waveguide here is of the order of a micron. There's no nanophotonics. But if I actually look, if I make a one nanometer change in the width of this waveguide, that leads to a one nanometer shift in the zero dispersion point. It's roughly that. And so there's nano here. Okay, and you really need very good control of the material. So normally you think, uh, and, and it turns out to, to make the losses very low, you actually need materials that have angstrom roughness or less. Okay, so, you know, my collaborator, Michal Lipson, who makes these, is always working on reducing the losses. And one of the things she has found is she basically has to have surfaces around this waveguide that are sub-angstrom in smoothness, in roughness. Okay, to, to get the best performance. So here's what the gain profile looks like. So I have a pump sitting here, and I then ask the question, well, when do I get amplification? That is, the signal idler will actually grow exponentially. And it turns out here I'm showing for different pump powers here, but the key part what you find is that there's certain frequency at which it peaks, and that is the point where that delta K actually vanishes. That's the point where the anomalous group velocity dispersion cancels the cross-phase modulation, and you can get uh, amplification. So you actually have no amplification at the pump. It's actually always off to some frequency. And it, it peaks at some point, and where it peaks depends on this balance between, you know, as I go to higher pump powers, I need more dispersion to cancel that, and that's why the peak moves linearly in that direction. So here's just an example of parametric gain in the silicon nitride waveguide. Again, the pump's sitting here. This is around 1.5 microns. The gain's not very high, but that's okay. For much of what we do, we don't need it to be very high because we're going to be putting this inside of very high Q microresonators, that is, cavities that are really have low losses. Okay, so that's the next part. So this is kind of an outline. I'm going to kind of jump already to the end to show you what we're going to get, and then I'm going to try to describe to you how this happens and what are the what, what is really beautiful underlying physics in how it actually gets generated. So we have the following system. We have this waveguide that I've been telling you about, which plays a very minor role here. It's just to get the light in and out. The important part is played by this microresonator here. Okay? And of course, it doesn't have to be circular. It just has to be something that closes on itself. And if you take this, way, this, so this is like a waveguide that closes on itself, and I bring it very close to here, so close that the evanescent waves for each of these overlaps. So if I then bring in light here, some of it will couple in here and come around. For the case in which you, know, you have the right frequency, that is, you are a mode of this microresonator, you'll actually get destructive interference to keep going this way and constructive interference to go this way. And so the light can actually build up inside the microresonator, and that corresponds to the case when you are actually a mode of the microresonator. So 
In fact, if you look at in, in the case where this is a very weak field and you scan its frequency, what you'll find is you'll have these regions when you look in the transmission here where you couple into the microresonator and then you get nothing, couple into another mode and so on. So uh, here I'm coming in and so initially what actually happens while you couple in, you get a, you know, most of your light actually goes through the wa waveguide, but as you tune into resonance, the light actually builds up inside of here. And if you've designed this waveguide right, if you design it so it has anomalous group velocity dispersion, you get parametric gain. And it's just like a laser. I have, a, uh, I have gain, I have a, a cavity here, and of course if the gain exceeds the loss, then it'll actually oscillate. And so you'd expect actually, unlike a regular laser, which typically lasers at, let's say, where the gain is maximum, and you know, combination of the gain is maximum, loss is minimum, here I have two peaks here that are gonna grow, the two modes, are going to grow, and these are correspond to the signal Neidler, and that would be the simple picture. Okay, as we'll see, what actually ends up happening, and you might say, oh, you get lots of all the different modes do, but what we'll see is there's some very interesting dynamics that goes on inside of here. That is, that you come in with a single frequency, and you actually actually excite a pulse inside here, and it's actually a soliton-like pulse. It's what's called a cavity soliton or a dissipative soliton and this pulse can actually circulate around here, and of course the pulse keeps coming out, and so in some ways it looks very much like a mode-locked laser, for those who are familiar with that. And so if you take, you know, pulses coming out periodically, and you take the Fourier transform, you get a comb, and that's in fact exactly what occurs in the system. And so you can see here, you start off with a single frequency at this point right here, and this, for example, is an experimental specter that spans an octave. Okay, so this is the generation of new frequencies. I start off with a source which is about 100 kilohertz line width, and I create a source that spans, you know, down below 1,200 nanometers and reaches out beyond 2,400. And in fact, we have other sources that can operate in the mid-infrared. And all of this is done in a chip, and it's done at power levels that are below 100 milliwatts. So, what are these combs useful for? I just mentioned to you the idea that you actually generate, you know, there's actually lines under each, at each of these points here, and I've already said that we're generating at each of these things. What are these combs useful for? What do they actually consist of? Well, they're just what they sound like. If you t imagine a comb of light, what is a comb of light? It's one in which you have these, dis the, the, instead of one frequency, you actually, or instead of like a thermal source, it's broadband, light only is generated at certain frequencies here. And you'd say, yeah, it's generated the modes of the laser, uh, you know, the modes, I'm sorry, of the microresonator. But those modes, because of dispersion, we have group velocity dispersion, remember we have that, they're actually not exactly equal. So actually, if you were to look at those modes, they'd actually be slightly misspaced. And it turns out to be a really useful comb. That is one that, 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 that many people in the community that use these for spectroscopy, that use it for timekeeping, that use it for, for, for many applications, you want this comb spacing to be absolutely precise. That is, if I know one of these frequencies, let's say I take this one and I compare it with a, a standard atomic line and I lock it to that line, I want to be able to count, you know, one, two, three, four, get to this point here and know this better than a hertz. Okay, so this spacing here has to be extremely precise. That is, that I could write the frequency of any point along this comb as an integer multiplied by the separation here or this repetition rate. And maybe there's also a frequency offset from DC, which of course is not really generated, but it exists. That is, if you could take this comb and extrapolate all the way down to DC, what is this offset? And this, plays, this offset plays a very big role in many different types of systems. Um, and you can think of it's the, the difference between an envelope uh, the, and, and the peak of the, the actual electric field oscillation. So these combs are just starting to really take off. They were really generated in a uh, fairly straightforward way in nonlinear optics uh, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, actually by my former student who was working at Bell Labs. But now people are really talking about using these combs for many applications. So you can imagine you start off with one laser source and I can create all these now very precise laser sources that are separated in, in a really good way. So you can imagine, you know, if, you, if for those who do telecommunications, I have a wavelength division multiplex source 
if I can do this on a chip, that would be great. Rather than having 100 lasers, I only, I only need one laser, and I can easily generate 100 sources this way. It turns out that these type of combs can be used to make what are called all optical clocks, which then can be used for making precision measurements. Uh, they're already being used for spectral calibration. As I said, you know, you have some unknown source, and now I have basically a frequency ruler here that I can compare with it, and so I can calibrate, uh, you know, do any spectral calibration. Uh, again, it can be used for many types of spectroscopy, so for chemical and biological sensing. We have recent work on this. Uh, but again, it has a you know, wide range of applications. And these combs, I think, really are, are they're already starting to be used, but you're, you're only going to see it being used more and more. You can actually buy one of these commercially. This is uh, you know, the company that currently, I would say, is by far the most successful at actually selling these combs and using them. This is called Menlo Systems. It was st started by Ronald Holdsworth, who was a former uh, uh, student of Ted Hanch's. And uh, we actually just bought one of these in our lab as a reference, and so you know it actually consists of a rack that looks something like this. It's actually all fiber. The, you know the, the comb itself is a fiber laser, and then they have a nonlinear fiber that they generate. So it's all done in a pretty compact system. It fits on a tabletop, but then you have all this rack here of electronics and everything else. And so this is where the chip part comes in. Okay, so this is what you know uh, uh, funding agencies like DARPA are telling us is we would like to take all this, which fits on a good portion of an optical table, half a four by eight table, and we want to fit it in a device that's one centimeter cubed, and we want it to draw less than a watt of power. This is actually true, okay, and, and do it in three years, okay. Um, so this is a recent DARPA program that we've been involved in. And again, their motivation is we want to be able to create these combs and use them in handheld devices, uh, be able to put these in um, data centers, uh, put them on, on satellites, these CubeSats that are really small, maybe some, some of them about this size, they shoot up to space and you know, can work for a year out, out in space and be used to do you know, many kinds of spectroscopy or precision measurements up in space. So there's a real motivation to take all this technology and put it all on a chip. So as I said earlier, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, from the first photograph, I said, you know, one way of generating new frequencies is you start off with a femtosecond pulse, and in our case, you know, a mode lock laser is a train of femtosecond pulses, and it's a train in the sense that it's, you know, really perfectly periodic in time. Of course, I Fourier transform this, uh, you can think of as a comb in time, you get a comb in uh, frequency. And then you pass this through a photonic crystal fiber. That's what, how it was first done, which is you get a very strong chi 3 non inter interaction, and you broaden this comb. And you can think of this two ways. And most of the community, how they did this is they said, well, I, I'm going to take one pulse at a time. It undergoes self phase modulation, and that broadens the spectrum through self phase modulation. But an alternative picture, which almost no one ever uses, is I've generated this comb here, which is you know, a Fourier transform of this. And I'm passing through this chi 3 interaction, and I'm just generating new frequencies here through anomalous group velocity dispersion. And lo and behold, what is the, for this fiber, for this to occur, what regime do you have to be in? The anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. Okay, so it's no coincidence. And, uh, and so in fact, for, you can think of this just in terms of four-wave mixing. Okay, so this is the standard way in which people have generated combs up until the last few years. What I'm going to be telling you about today is one, again, where, which I mentioned, which you start off with a single frequency, couple them to a microresonator, and generate a comb this way. So it's very different from kind of the standard one. But in both cases, you need a small amount of anomalous group velocity dispersion. That is the regime you want to be in. So let's just stop there. So here's the picture, as I said. You have a single input wavelength. We have parametric gain. If it exceeds the loss, you get parametric oscillation, so you can imagine well, what's going to happen? I come in with a pump, and the signal and idler, if the dispersion is right, they grow at one of the modes there, and, and so this happens. And actually, this was first observed by in Kerry Valhalla's group uh, a number of years ago, and that was kind of the end of the story. But then what you found is that um, in, in, early, in, in really the first work done by Tobias Kippenberg, he actually found that you don't just get these guys here. You actually get a full range of frequencies, a comb spectrum, as, as I showed you earlier. So here I just show what happens if I was to take this uh, continuous wave laser, couple them to the microresonator, and then 
start turning up the input power. And what you find is at a certain point here, I look for a signal in idler to grow, and all of a sudden you see that they grow, and they grow roughly linearly, and then it becomes kind of a mess. And so the question is, what, you know, what's happening at that point? I, I should point out this is 50 milliwatts. Uh, currently, right now, we are, we can design systems that have thresholds. Now we're down to 100, micro, 100 microwatts of power. Okay, so this is this optical parametric oscillator right near threshold. You see this is the point where they grow. And note that this is not the nearest order mode. That there's actually probably about eight modes in between here. This is the one, though, where, the, again, the dispersion and the nonlinearity inside the cavity are just right. And so these are the ones that grow. But you can see, unlike you know, second order OPOs, for those who are familiar with them, you can't help but almost just start generating new frequencies because once these are generated, this can act like a pump, it can mix with this one, you can generate one over here. It's almost impossible to, 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 to suppress this one. You'd actually need a very severe dispersion here in order to do it. And in fact, as you turn up the power, you, as I showed you earlier, you get these comb spectra. And the spacing here roughly is to you know, pretty good accuracy, just depends on whatever is the round trip, or you can think of as the size, the diameter of this uh, microresonator. So, you know, I can generate combs with 400 gigahertz spacing, uh, 1.2 terahertz spacing, 200 gigahertz spacing. And all I'm cha these are all on the same chip. All I'm doing is just coupling them into a different microresonator with a different radius. Um, so again, uh, you know, it can be easily, I can control the space. And this can't be easily done in a laser where you could just, you know, dial in some new spacing. And in fact, in microresonators currently, basically, you can now generate basically uh, combs from a few, a few gigahertz out to uh, beyond a terahertz. So it's a pretty wide range. And all this could be done on the same chip. So this is the, you know, one of the key parts, and it turns out for a number of applications, you need an octave spanning comb. This allows you to do what's called self-referencing. Um, but here's an example of it uh, where we, we've actually generated over 150 terahertz bandwidth. And again, this, you know, one of our motivations, one of the funding agencies was to build clocks, you know, on chip and again, requires pretty modest powers. So as I said earlier, uh, these were first observed by Tobias Kippenberg at EPFL. Uh, he was doing this in these microtords that were developed in Kerry Valhalla's group. So this is fused silica glass. They take a, a, a nanotaper and they bring it very close to the edge here and couple in. So although there's been just gorgeous work coming out of that group on that, those aren't things that are gonna be necessarily robust and, and, and portable. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, very soon after, uh, people looked in other systems. Uh, you had a group from OE Waves who did these in fluoride, whispering gallery modes. And, and then <clears throat> you had uh, work uh, which, which we've led and many groups have followed up on on silicon nitride, but also aluminum nitride, aluminum gallium arsenide. Uh, um, I guess I forgot what this trade name for this glass is, but it's high index glass. Uh, Diamond, and, and our group uh, at Cornell, now at Columbia, uh, with uh, Michal, uh, have focused on these silicon-based devices. And so we've generated combs in both of these devices. So these, we believe, are, are you know, best for near IR, and, and, and we're currently working at trying to push the visible regime, and silicon is good for, for uh, uh, mid-IR. So here I just show you an example, a selection, of, of where these combs have been generated on microresonators. So this is sort of the early work that was done in glass by Tobias Kippenberg. This is our work in silicon nitride. Uh, these are the fluorides. And then you can see the mid-infrared. And again, if you wanted to track this, just look at uh, you know, what DARPA was funding, and you'll get a very accurate representation of, of where this was going. And so DARPA, for the last uh, two, three years, has been funding, trying to generate micro res uh, mid-infrared microresonator combs, and so this has motivated us, and so this is our mo most recent work where we're now uh, really being able to push this three to six micron regime, which is a real s sweet spot for molecular sensing. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, just to give you an idea of, you know, these silicon-based, you know, I already mentioned why one would do it. They're fully monolithic, they're sealed, uh, CMOS compatible. You can hopefully put this all together with electronics. Uh, I just want to emphasize one particular point is, is sort of what the type of cues that you can get. Uh, and currently, Michal's group just reported a 30 million. This is really astonishing uh, to think this is a high confinement uh, cavity here. Uh, 
and you can actually get cues, and, and she sees actually a path to 100 million now uh, inside these, uh, in, in, in these type of structures. Silicon is typically a, lot, a little more lossy, so you're, you're really going to be stuck at about a million, maybe a few million, um, but still, um, that, that's certainly good. But, you know, the fact, the fact that the nonlinearity is uh, you know, even 10 times higher in silicon nitride means you can still do everything with milliwatt powers. So here I just show, this is on the same chip. You can generate combs at 1.5 micron. You just change the width, you know, translate over, go to another micro resonator, and you can generate combs at, centered at one micron. And so actually, uh, we have data where we now can overlap with a cesium line here. So in principle, this comb could be locked to a, uh, an atomic reference. Uh, but you can also, as I mentioned, push the mid-infrared. So these are ones that are actually generated in silicon. This is pumping at three microns. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these, but this is actually represents a mode lock comb here, and now it's spanning from about 4.3 microns down to 2.3, so it's almost an octave. And we've actually used these combs to do something called dual comb spectroscopy. For anyone who knows about spectroscopy, it's a very powerful technique which allows you to do uh, very high precision spectroscopy with no moving parts. Uh, and the fact is that you can put two of these combs on chip mode lock them both, very stable system. Uh, they just have slightly different comb spacing, and it allows you to do a certain kind of spectroscopy, which is, can be very uh, promising, again, for those applications. So I want to tell you a little bit. So now you've just kind of seen the result, and everything I, you've showed you is in the, in the frequency domain. What, what, what do things look like in the time domain? Well, you can't see this here, but this is 2011. Actually, this is data we actually never published, wish we had, because uh, it actually shows all the dynamics that, that and now everyone in the world, now that the whole community understands, but we didn't know what it was at the time. And to be honest, reviewers were so suspicious of all these results that we could not get it published. Um, so here what I'm showing is uh, autocorrelation of the output from the comb. And what we found is when we all of a sudden saw that the RF noise in the comb dropped by about 30 dB, we would see in the time domain that we could actually get uh, what looked like pulses. So just to give you an idea, this one corresponds to the round trip time. So this is what pulses coming out every round trip. So it sounds like a laser. But then sometimes we found we would get pulses at twice, at, you know, two pulses every round trip. Sometimes three pulses, sometimes four pulses, and so on. And we had no idea why this happening. We tried uh, submitting a paper saying that this was evidence of mode locking, and they came back and said, you must have a satchable absorber in this system. There must be something in there, because you can't get mode locking without a satchable absorber. And uh, it took us uh, two years to get this paper published. Um, but here was the case, and another important part, uh, which was the measurement of the comb spacing when we were in this mode locked regime. So normally. You know, if you looked at the comb spacing, you'd see pretty large deviations. But all of a sudden, when you got in that mode locked regime, this is the deviation from being equidistant. So as a function of wavelength across the comb. This is hertz. So this is from 1 hertz to minus 1 hertz. And that was about the measurement of the accuracy of this experiment. This is really a beautiful experiment by Mark Foster, who did this work. And showed that actually this was a really good comb. So this is now roughly one part in 10 to the 15 in terms of accuracy and was indicative that you could, and actually this was very controversial at the time. A lot of people thought in these microresonator combs you could not generate good combs um, that, you know, because of the dispersion, but this was an indication that you really could. And then uh, there was uh, really the, the thing that kind of triggered everything was this work by Stefan Cohen and Miro Urcantalo. Uh, and really, the microresonator community was not paying attention to what was, had happened in the fiber resonator community. And uh, there had been a lot of work in the late 80s and early 90s on fiber microresonators. And one of the things they found is they used this equation, which was called the Lujato Lefebvre equation, which is really like a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. What's a nonlinear Schrodinger equation? Well, you have some slow evolution in time. And then you have a fast evolution, which corresponds to the round trip, what's going on inside one round trip. And this, just depend, and this second order derivative, it just depends on the dispersion. You have the nonlinearity inside here, the third order nonlinearity. And then because it's inside a cavity, you're pumping with a pump, which is a continuous wave pump. And then you have loss and the detuning of the pump from here. And so it turns out that they had shown 
that there actually, this <laughs> equation had what are called dissipative solutions, and they're the hyperbolic secants. And in fact, there are solutions that are, where you have one soliton side, two soliton, three soliton, you could have all of those, these were all. And plus, you had the strong CW component, and that's just the pump. And in fact, this is from a paper, optic com optics communication paper from this, the, this 1992 paper, showing these multiple solitons. Of course, uh, it wasn't microresonators, but it was really Stefan Cohen who was part of that community and started doing modeling. This really opened up uh, understanding for how these microresonator combs. So this is work that we had done, theoretical work, showing what happens as you tune into resonance and what does the, let's say, what happens in one round trip and what does the optical spectrum look like? So here's just a cross section. So you can see early on, you actually get kind of these oscillations. This is kind of modulational instability, and these are known as Turing patterns, for those who are familiar with that. And you get kind of a spectrum here that's kind of filled in. As you tune closer into resonance, you actually enter what's a chaotic regime. Spectrum is still pretty broad. Then you get in a regime where you have multiple solitons. And then if you do things right, you tune just right here, you can actually excite a single soliton. And note, there's no saturable absorber in the system. We are just tuning very carefully, and we can actually excite uh, a single soliton in this regime. So this was actually, and so here I'll just show, I keep forgetting if I have to go here to trigger it. But here what you're showing is a movie. Um, as we tune, so the top is the tuning, so we tune into resonance and we generate the spectrum, and this is what's happening, this is one round trip. So there's lots of little pulses, then you get into this chaotic regime, and so we've just tuned there, and this is basically chaotic, and then you tune one more time, you excite multiple solitons that are just circulating around the cavity. If you tune just right one last time, basically all the solitons go away except for one, and you can excite a single soliton in the system. So this corresponds to one pulse that's just circulating inside this cavity. Uh, oops. So since then, uh, so, you know, we, we observed this early on, as I said, in 2013, and then it was really a beautiful paper by Tobias Kippenberg's group that actually showed, you know, that this really is this hyperbolic secant shape. We just showed that we were getting pulses and that there, you know, the RF noise was low. And Tobias' group showed that you actually can get these, excite these multiple solitons and so on. And since then, they've basically been observed in all of these. So this is very generic. It's not unique to silicon nitride. It happens in all these microresonators, whether it's glass, a fluorides, or silicon. You can see this type of behavior. So here I just want to show an example for silicon nitride where just as you tune into resonance, just like the theory shows, you begin getting this comb here. You then get this noisy region, which shows a pretty broad comb, but if you look at the RF noise, it's very noisy. And then if you do things just right, you get into the regime where basically there's no noise and you get this hyperbolic secant that comes out. So it's just an example of what uh, you can do this. Now it turns out that one of the issues is you always have to tune your laser all the time. And in fact, particularly is that something I didn't mention is there's thermal effects and everything else. So sometimes you have to tune your laser 100 gigahertz. It's very hard to get a single frequency laser that can tune that far. And so alternatively, what we looked for was to start off with a very narrow line width laser that can't tune. And then what we do is we just put a resistive element on the microresonator. It's just sitting on chip and we can just use a thermoelastic effect to just slightly tune the refractive index and tune it in this way. And this should allow us to completely control all the mode locking dynamics inside the cavity electronically. We just tune the current source here to this resistive heater and control everything that way. And in fact, what we find is by just tuning that current, we can get in the regime where we have one pulse circulating around, two pulses that are actually opposite each other. And under those conditions was exactly opposite, every other line disappears. So now the comb spacing is twice as large here as it was there. And then you can, in the case where you have four pulses circulating around, and now with a free spectral range, it's four times as big. So that gives you an example of how we can control this. And, and again, there's you know, many groups working on this uh, area right now. And um, if you have you know, more questions about this, I'll be happy to answer. So, um, you know, Peter touched on the, the ability to do computing and, you know, um, you know, we have a digital processor, which is, you know, electronics, which has been extraordinarily successful. You know, again, if you went through the 80s, you know, I'm sure Bob remembers this. Everyone's very excited about optical bistability. I always like to tell the story. 
of how Bob sent me to this optical bistability conference. There was a whole conference on just optical bistability, 400 people there, I mean, which is that you could make an optical transistor using light. And it, you know, you'd put a piece of gallium arsenide inside a cavity and it, you could show hysteresis and light was gonna completely change how we do computing, okay? And um, so they brought in a guy named uh, John Armstrong who was actually a postdoc of Nicholas Blomberden. And he had done a lot of work on nonlinear optics, early work, he's actually on the papers that led to, to, to Blomberden's Nobel Prize. And, and he at the time was the vice president for research at IBM. And everyone thought he was gonna come into this conference and just cheer everyone on and tell everyone about how great optics is for computing and optical visibility. And of course, you know, people had shown that you got very fast, you could get very fast turn on times. And, 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 and so, Tom, um, I'm sorry, uh, Armstrong got up there and gave a 45 minute talk on the Joseph Injunction. And no one, I think the audience was kind of befuddled. Why is he talking about the Joseph Injunction? And you know, he ended up the talk, and he's getting close to the end, and you say, well, he says, you know, we spent $2 billion, IBM spent $2 billion on trying to commercialize and make Joseph Injunction successful in computers. And they really had great performance characteristics, much better than what your photonic devices have. And he says, and we couldn't make it work, because they were just too unstable, fabrication, gallium arsenide, all the issues there. And he says, you know, you keep competing with silicon where it is today. He says, you gotta compete with the time, it, by the time you get one of these in place, it's 15 years from now, and I can tell you with very good certainty where silicon is gonna be in 15 years. And he says, it's gonna be a lot faster than it is now, exponentially faster. And, and then he finished off with the last words of the talk, and by the way, an electron is a lot smaller than a photon. <laughs> and, and honest to God, there was, just scattered clapping and no one, you know, people were just astounded that he would do this. But he was absolutely right in everything he said. And for a long period, if you went to a program officer, as a young professor, I would do that. If you mentioned optical by stability, program officer would just hang up the phone. Okay, so it was thought of, you know, that was just not something you'd do. So here I am talking about optical computing again. And I love optical computing. I thought it was a great idea. But now I want to revisit. And certainly Peter already touched on quantum computing. So there is a role. And the role is how, kind of how I'm picturing it here. I don't think you should be looking for a general processor that's going to operate using quantum optics or, as I'll talk about, coherent computing or whatever. But you're going to look at it that it's a processor that has an interface to a conventional electronic in which you, know, you have many classes of problems that can't be easily solved here, but can perhaps be solved on some type of structure that's based on photonics, and that's what I'm focusing on. So you know, if you look, you know, this is kind of an interesting, this is the clock speed. So you know, I remember, you know, many of the students don't remember this, but you know, every time you bought a computer, the clock speed just kept going up, and that was almost like your definition of speed. You know, you know I have a 100 megahertz. Uh, computer, you know, you have a 50 megahertz one, you know, now, and very interestingly, the clock speeds have pretty much petered out about three gigahertz, and they're not going to increase. And the, one of the main reasons is, for example, is they just, the chips get too hot. And, you know, scaling, if you look at thermal effects, go like frequency squared, and so the thermal effects are just preventing it. So clock speeds have just petered out. And the only way they're gaining speed now is just going to multi-core and, and a higher number of processors and having them run in parallel. Um, you know, number of transistors on the chip, that's still, but that's going to start leveling off too. I mean, you're, you're just going to get to the point where you can't build a gate that can hold off a uh, voltage. You know, it's just going to be just too few atoms to hold off the voltage. So, it also, what people are looking at is that there are a lot of problems, as Peter pointed out, for example, the factoring problem, which really scale exponentially with time and energy. And so, there's no way of attacking them with conventional computers. So, what I want to tell you is one problem, for example, in which you cannot solve easily by any type of computer, and it's called the Ising model, okay? So this came from condensed matter physics in the 20s, and it was a toy model used for ferromagnetism, which now has been realized in a number of systems, and it's a very simple model. It consists of a collection of spins, which can be either up or down, you know, and of course they were thinking, you know, you had some kind of atom or molecule here which had a spin, 
that are, let's say, weakly coupled through, let's say, just a magnetic interaction. You know, you just had dipole-dipole coupling. So if you write down the Hamiltonian, the two spins are coupled, and there's some coupling constant here which determines that. Now, it turns out that if you look for, try to find the ground state energy for the system, that is what, you know, you, you define what the JIJs are between all of these, and you try to find the ground state energy, it actually scales exponentially with time or in terms of trying to solve this problem. Very difficult problem to solve, and particularly if you go to higher dimensions. Three, you know, you can solve this in 1D. Uh, analytically, I think 2D in certain cases you can. 3D, you can't solve it all. And so, um, I'm sorry. So the question, so it turns out that this is precisely this MP-hard type problem that Peter mentioned earlier, that just finding the ground state for these coupled spins is a very hard problem. But the most interesting part is if you can find the ground state, it turns out there's a whole class of problems, these very difficult problems, everything from neuroscience, biological, socioeconomics, for example, traveling salesman problem. If you can solve this problem, you can solve the traveling salesman problem. They're equivalent. You can map one onto the other. And so that turns out to be now kind of our holy grail goal here is to try to solve the icing model in this particular case. And here I'm going to show you a way in which you could do this optically. And this was actually motivated by recent work that Yoshi Yamamoto's group in Japan has been doing. And here I'm just going to go to a Chi-2 medium just to show it, but I'll show that we can do this now in a Chi-3 medium. So the whole thing is here, we had these coupled spins. So we want to create a system that has a spin. And you say, well, photons have spin. This is a different kind of spin. It's not a real spin, but it behaves like a spin. Okay. Now imagine you have what's called difference frequency generation, where one photon creates a signal and an idler in this way. Okay, so this is a chi-2 interaction here. And you could imagine putting these two inside a cavity. You come in with a pump. And everything I told you about for chi-3 is the same here. You have to have energy conservation. That is, you know, this frequency has to add up to these two. You need momentum conservation. And it turns out if you work out what this momentum conservation is, and you look at the phase relationship between these three waves here, it's that the phase of the pump minus the phase of these two has to have some fixed relationship. And every time you start and stop and you, know, you turn off the pump and, and then turn it back on, there has to be this phase relationship that must exist every time you turn it on. So let's imagine the case where now the signal and idler become the same frequency. Well, now it's just one field. I just have one field inside of here. So I have one pump, one field. You know, you design the cavity so that it really forces this degenerate condition here. So the momentum is just that K1 has to add up to twice K2. And this phase relationship, now the two phases add up together, so now I have a two here. And so what that means, though, is that every time you stop and start this, this phase relationship, phi2 can change by pi, and this phase relationship hasn't changed. So every time I put my hand inside the cavity and take it out, and I look at the phase of the field, it's going to flip by pi. It's just like a spin. Okay? And so this is you know, sometimes called biphase state generation. But it's, it turns out that you know, this field is, has one EV. So this is all quantum initiated. This starts from you know, quantum noise. And so this forms a way in which one can create a photonic spin. It's not a spin in the sense of a photon or polarization, but it's a spin in the sense that it can be up or down depending on what its phase is. And so one can build, and this is what Yoshi Yamamoto has been working on, is building a Chi-2. And so he actually took a uh, large cavity Chi-2 and then put these delay lines in here to have couplings between these and basically put four pulses circulating inside here and actually showed he could solve a four, uh, you know, a four oscillator, have a coupled OPO system, and he could actually solve, at least in this case, four element, four spins. It's a trivial case, but he could solve it in this particular case. But of course, you can see it now, all these delay lines and everything else, and in fact, more recently, he's done a Chi-3 fiber system. Actually, we did a Chi-3 system before, but he's done this with a about a 20 kilometer long fiber, put many pulses inside, circulating inside, and, and tried to, to do it this way. So one way of thinking about this icing machine is you're looking for the ground state. So if you think about this energy, you know, the loss, there's some point at which when you have all these coupled oscillators, 
where you want to get to the ground state. Let's say it's this point here. But of course, it's hard to get there because you, know, you, you tend to go to these local minima. And there's classical annealing where you can try to punch it out and get it to here. There's quantum annealing techniques that allow you to tunnel through and tr try to get to there. But actually, all of those uh, scale in terms uh, in an exponential way with problem size. Our system is a little bit different here because we're actually, it's a photonic system. We have our pump off, and then we keep turning on the pump. And there's going to be a certain point where all of a sudden we get the threshold. And by definition, we're at threshold, that's the ground state. So it's a nice advantage, at least of this system, in terms of looking for the ground state as compared to kind of the conventional annealing techniques and other systems that are, you know, always, you know, you have to cool down in some way. So our system, we're doing, we're going to do the same kind of system, but now in a chi-3. And so now instead of one photon up, we have two photons going up, and we're generating a signal idler that are degenerate. That is, we have two pumps here, and we're going to be generating this guy here right in the middle. That's how you get this to all add up just right. Okay. So this is actually the opposite of what I told you about earlier, where you had one pump here and you generated the signal idler. We're actually kind of putting in these two, and we're going to try to generate this. But now the dispersion has to be such that you favor this. You don't want to each, you know, you don't want each pump to generate new frequencies on their own. You only want this one to, to be generated. And if you can do this in a microresonator and start coupling these with bus waveguides, this perhaps could scale to a large number because this is all integrated photonics technology. And so that's the holy grail goal. So I, I'm leaving out a lot of the math, but I'm just going to cut to the chase here, which is if you look at the forward mixing gain, this is actually very intriguing. For this system where you have two pumps, and we want the case where the gain is highest on axis. And it turns out in the anomalous regime, it turns out the gain is always lowest on axis. But in the normal group velocity dispersion regime, so that's really easy. Okay, so we actually took the same microresonator tuned so that we're in the normal group velocity dispersion regime. I'll, I'll just hop to this case here. So this is a simulation. So here, we've done all this work at generating. So now we're in the no normal group velocity dispersion regime. We do the simulation. We see that this one grows. That's exactly what we're looking for. And every time we do the simulation, every time we turn it on and off, we see that the phase flips by pi. So it's behaving just like our photonic spin. So we set up our laser system. We have two pump lasers coupled into the silicon nitride micro ring in the normal dispersion regime. And sure enough, as we tune them, uh, the two pumps, and we tune them in so that we actually get into just the right regime, we actually generate a degenerate frequency at this point. And in fact, let me hop to this point. If we then generate uh, under the right conditions, we look at the phase for this, we see this is a, a measurement. Every time we turn on and off the system, we have output. But if we actually measure the phase, which is the bottom after passing through an interferometer, you can see we get high, low, high, low. So here we have now our quantum random number generator that's just generated here with very good contrast. And again, it turns out that if you look and do all statistics, someone asked the question, how do you know if it's random? Well, it turns out NIST has a whole statistical test suite which allows you and here I'm just showing, I don't know, about a dozen, but there are, we use about 20 to actually analyze how random this really is. And it really satisfies all the conditions for being truly random in this system. So, uh, so now we have a quantum random number generator, which again has lots of applications. Uh, so let me hop to this part here. So just to give you an idea, we're currently looking at trying to have a system where we have coupled microresonators where we have the coupling level below, we have the microresonators in this plane, and then we have the readouts above. So this will allow us to actually try to create a whole array of this system. And I'll just summarize by saying that you know, we're looking at doing full stabilization and locking of these combs, trying to build a chip-based all-optical clock. At this point, no one really knows what the phase noise limits for these combs are, but we're looking at it. But we think it has a wide range of applications, and I think you're going to see these combs over the next decade actually enter into sort of real devices that consumers are using. Uh, you know, we're still at the edge of looking at doing coherent photonic computing. This is a classical system. It's not the quantum one. And I think there's still a lot unknown about when can classical and quantum systems what kind of problems can they solve? I will say, you know, when you take the regular uh, computer, it's moving bits of charge, ones and zeros. That's kind of incoherent processing. Quantum computing is using interference. We're actually, in the classical system, there's also wave interference going on. And I think that still 
you know, uh, unknown quantities to know what kind of problems can you solve. If you still have this wave interference, it may not be the same kind of problems that quantum computers can solve, but certainly uh, it's, it's certainly interesting to explore. And I just want to thank a great group of postdocs and students that have worked on all these problems, and all the work here is done in close collaboration with Michal Lipson's group uh, and her students. Thank you. The question is about spectral flatness of foam. Uh, does it matter, uh, or how difficult it is to design something which is a flat uh, spectrum? Uh, or at least putting close to the, 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 the inverse The second question is, why does the sol solitons call dissipated solitons? Uh, it depends what you want. Uh, if you want a mode lock comb uh, that's very, very broad, you're stuck with a hyperbolic secant squared. That's the envelope, and there's, there's not an easy way to get around that. There are combs that are relatively narrow, actually generated in the normal dispersion regime under certain conditions, which are relatively flat. You don't generate nearly as many comb lines, but I think for telecommunications, which certainly, you know, people who do WDM sources, you want relatively flat combs, it, it, they could be useful there. They're called dissipative solitons because, you know, in a fiber, typically you have these solitons, which is this infinite system. Here, you have a soliton which is experiencing loss. In fact, you have a cavity where it couples out. So, and you have gain. So the gain from the laser is, is, is kind of, is opposing the loss. And then you have the, the you know, dispersion and nonlinearity, which are kind of compensating. So that type of soliton that occurs when you're in the presence of a fair amount of loss but is coupled with gain are called dissipative solitons, also cavity solitons. Paul. So how intense is the light circulating in these soliton condition and what do you do about precarriers that are generated? Is it dope, so dope silicon? So in, in, in silicon, uh, so the question is uh, about, you know, how intense the light is. So j just to give you an idea is um, how robust, particularly silicon nitride. So let me consider two cases. So you don't generate free carriers in silicon nitride, so that's where you can generate the highest powers. So in silicon nitride, the CW power due to the pump, when you're actually resonantly coupled, can be about 50 watts, 50 to 100 watts circulating with a few hundred milliwatts input. So it's a high Q. So what's amazing is that's confined into a region of a few hundred microns, and it's very robust, and you have 50 watts circulating around that cavity. So, and that corresponds, turns to roughly what the peak power of the pulses are. So the peak power is you know, of the order of that inside the cavity. Uh, for silicon, and I kind of left all that out, you know, if Michal was here, she would give a, a different talk, and she would talk about how we remove those free carriers, but in silicon, even if you are three photon, you still generate a lot of free carriers, and they introduce loss, and all you do is she designs them so that it puts a pin structure, so she actually has a pin structure uh, near the waveguide, which removes the free carriers, you apply a voltage, remove the free carriers, or shorten, I mean, you're removing them, but what you're really doing is shortening the free carrier lifetime, and that reduces the loss due to that. But that turns out to be critical. And this will be the last question then. Uh, so, Albert Stolo. Uh, your photonic spin, I'm wondering, is that the same thing as Barry's phase? No. I mean, it's, it's there's no, it's topological effect here. So it's not due to the fact that, you know, we're bringing it around. I mean, I, I'm careful to always put photonic spin in quotes because, you know, people really want to see this, but it's, it's an analogy to the spin only in that the field, you know, its phase can be up or down. Um, but I don't think it has an, you know, I don't know, maybe there could be a Barry's phase, but in this case, it's definitely not Barry's phase because it's not due to a topological uh, propagation in a third dimension. I shouldn't do this, but one last question. <laughs> uh, did you say that every, you block it and unblock it at every time it changes phase? Boys, where would the internal memory come from? There's no internal memory. So how does it, well, how does it flip phase? I mean, why does it? Uh, it's completely, it's, that's, it's initiated it, by quantum noise. Oh, it does it randomly? Yes. Oh, you didn't say that. You said every time it, it changes. Right. Oh, 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 you're saying it that it changes. Up, down, up, oh, down. I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I didn't say that correctly then. I meant that. Um, well, maybe you it, said it correctly. Maybe, no, 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 maybe no, no. It was the receptor that was. 
Yeah, uh, maybe no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, it's random. Okay, so good. sometimes it changes. Oh, so that I tried made to. Everybody in this audience very happy that you clarified this. So yeah, I mean, this is a kind of a typical outline that you see here. So you know, maybe four in a row is you might get nine, nine, nine. You don't know if it's up or down. Then two down, one up, down. Okay. So th this is random here. We're all very happy now. Okay. So let, let's that. thank Alice again for uh, such a wonderful talk.